former bosses, the Dohanj brothers, and he would take drastic action to make sure they would be sent out of the picture forever. I wouldn't shoot you in the back, but it'd do it right face to face, square in the forehead. First on the list was Jimmy. Johal planned and executed him in February of 1994. It was believed that Jimmy had taken a hit on Johal worth over $230,000. Not only was this organized crime, but it was orchestrated. It was a public showing off, if you will, one that's not been seen since. Who were the Assange brothers, Ron and Jim, who would later have a falling out with Bindi Johal. Instead of carrying out the assassination, the hitman Jimmy had hired approached Johal and offered to take out Jimmy instead, and he jumped at the chance to take his enemy by surprise. After the hit, Johal even had the nerve to appear on live television to speak about the event. And this Jimmy Dosange, they portrayed him as a hitman, this, that. I mean, I guess he was a very serious person. From what I've seen of him on the street, I personally think he couldn't have hit his way out of a paper bag. His intention was to insult his former employers. And what followed was a very public war of words captured on camera for the world to see. Bindi, I'm here and I'm bad mouth you, buddy. Okay? If you want to talk about nobody, if, if anybody's a nobody, buddy. April 1994 and surviving brother Ron was driving his pickup through the streets of Vancouver. After pulling up at a red light, another vehicle pulled up beside him. He would come face to face with the barrel of an AK-47 and certain death. Ron Dosange took several bullets to the face and died almost instantly. Just weeks later, Johal's neighbor, Greg Olson, who was walking his dog, was killed in a case of mistaken identity outside his own home. There were multiple gang-related murders through the 90s, including the death of Johal's neighbor, Glenn Olson, an innocent bystander who was out walking his dog. The very next day, Bindi Johal was charged with the first-degree murder of the Dosanj brothers, alongside the suspected gunman, Sarbit Jill, Rajinder Big Jal Benji, Michael Kim Bundai, Sun News Lai, Preet Peter Sarbit Gill, and Kim Phil Hosick. The trial would send the media into a frenzy. And there were finally charges. No one could have written the twist that happened during the court case. But this case would be as chaotic as the rest of Johal's life, and the most unlikely of occurrences would see him walk free from court in a shocking twist of fate that no one saw coming. Bindi, along with his former brother-in-law, Peter Gill, were charged with Jim Dosanjh's murder. It was one of the most expensive trials in Canadian history just because of the security needed. Both walked when it was learned that Gill was having an affair with George Jillian Guess. Gill would face six years incarceration for obstruction of justice, and his lover, Gillian, would be sent down for 18 months. Despite attempts to appeal the acquittal of Johal, he managed to walk out of court a free man. Even after a narrow escape from the law, this gangster had no plans for retirement. Johal even once held notorious Chinese triad gangster Randy Chan for ransom. Predictably, Vancouver's first celebrity gangster met his demise at 4.30 a.m. on December 20th, 1998. After a dispute with a Chinese gang over the sale and quality of narcotics, Johal decided to take the fight straight to the enemy. It was October 25th, 1996, when Randy Chan was abducted by Johal's men and was held for over two days in the trunk of a car and would only be released if his brother paid a handsome fee for his return. Johal demanded five kilograms of narcotics and after negotiations was able to secure $500,000 in cash paid for by the Lotus Triads. They were led by Chan's brother, who paid out after desperately wanting the safe return of his sibling. By 1997, Johal's temper would once again get the the better of him, and he would face the law over an assault in a bar with a broken beer bottle, adding to his already hefty rap sheet. But even after his dangerous nature and disregard for others, he had become something of a celebrity, and not just in the underworld, as he had once become known as the Scarface of Vancouver. I just want these guys to know you got another thing coming, bitch. I'm still around. He wasn't around long. Bindi Johal's fast life came to a fast end. Over the next few years, Johal would embark on a killing spree, using the elite to take out rivals, fellow gang members, and just about anyone who chose to cross him. His first targets would be the associates of his former rivals, the Dosange brothers, who he would periodically take out one person at a time. His last known hits would be one of his own gang members and a close associate, showing the same disregard as he did for anyone who he thought had wronged him. First was Derek 
Chang Shankar, who had insulted Johal after he refused to join Shankar at a nightclub. Instead of just leaving Johal to his own devices, he would tease his temperamental boss to the point where his life would soon be in danger. Lo and behold, when Shankar was sleeping in his car after falling asleep drunk one September night in 1998, he woke to find Johal pointing a gun at his face and certain death. Only weeks later, an associate, Roman Danny Mann, would express his desire to leave the criminal life, enraging Johal so much he punched Mann into unconsciousness. Not satisfied with the punishment dished out, Johal decided Mann's life was to end. Mann was found in an industrial estate the same night with a single fatal bullet wound to the head. When Johal's lieutenant, Batar, asked about the murder, he was told, blame it on the HA, otherwise known as the Hell's Angels. But Johal's life of crime would come to a bloody end on December 20th, 1998, at the Palladium nightclub, when his assassin shot him in the head and brought an end to the life of Bindi Johal for good.